earlier this week, I was sitting at my kitchen table, and at our kitchen table, there's uh, three windows, and it overlooks this common area for this sanitary improvement uh, district that we live right next to. And as I was looking out, there was four trees that were planted uh, in May of this year. They were uh, four spruce trees. Each of them is probably about 10 feet tall or so. Now, I had hopes that just within a couple years, these uh, fast-growing spruce trees would grow to 20 or 30 or even 40 feet, and the new view out my uh, uh, kitchen window or our kitchen window would be these uh, beautiful spruce trees. So I looked out at these trees uh, about three months later, and there is no life at all in any of these four trees. Uh, these four trees are as brown as brown can get. There's not even a hint of green. These four trees have died. Now, the reason that they died is because they didn't receive any water. This uh, part of the commons area is not irrigated, and even if it was, I don't think it probably would have made much difference. They did not get the nutrition that they needed uh, you know, to survive. You know, so I looked at the grass around the uh, trees, and the grass is brown. There's no green in the grass. A few weeks ago, I made a joke up here uh, about the guys that drove over the dead grass in the lawnmower, and I can guarantee you they'll be back tomorrow uh, getting their paycheck, rearranging the dead grass. You know, the grass is dormant. Um, I don't think that grass is probably going to be green until next spring. You know, even if it starts to rain, uh, like, you know, today for a long time, I don't think that, you know, probably by uh, this fall it could ever be green again. Yes, I decided to go uh, running, and I get in the car, and I back out of our driveway, and if you've been to our house before, on our uh, driveway right to the side of it, there is uh, 10 daylilies. Now, usually in August, these plants are absolutely beautiful. Um, they're great big, full lilies. They're green, and usually there's dozens of yellow flowers popping out each of these, uh, each of these plants. And I looked, and of the 10 plants, there was one total flower. This, this yellow flower that's trying to uh, survive that was sticking out. And instead of being big and green and full of life, um, you know, they were pretty brown as well. There's some green, but uh, not much at all. And I drove by the um, golf course at Tiburon on 168th Street uh, as I was headed down to 370. And these people there, they would have to spend uh, thousands of dollars a month um, you know, watering the fairways and the greens to keep things green. But even if you look at the fairways or the greens there, um, you know, there's a lot of brown. You know, and what would the landscaper say? He would say that it, it's stressed. You know, the grass is stressed because of the lack of uh, rain and the excess heat. You know, so then I um, get on the highway between Omaha and um, Springfield and Louisville, and I'm driving through these cornfields. And usually uh, at the end of August, the corn is 10 feet high. It's green, and uh, the corn is uh, full of fruit. And you look over at these cornfields, and these things are uh, brown as well. And the corn stalks are actually struggling, you know, just to uh, stand up. You can drive a mile here to the farm on 180th and Harrison Street, and you can see that there's no corn in these crops. And if it wasn't for the next stock, the stock would surely fall down. You know, so then I got to Platte River State Park. And, um, you know, usually in August, it's, it's humid, it's, it's muggy, um, you know, there's uh, bugs and stuff. And it, it reminded me of late August, or uh, I'm sorry, late uh, October. You know, that's really what it reminded me of. And it was sad. It wasn't like the, the bright big leaves that would cover the trail. It was just these little dormant leaves that were, you know, falling off the trees. Now, did you hear the words that I used to describe the current drought that we're in? The words I used were dying, dormant, uh, losing life, lackluster, stressed, strained, unproductive, failing, and barren. These are the words that describe the trees. These are the words that describe the grass, the flowers, the corn, you know, the, uh, the trees uh, you know, at, at the park. And um, drought, it, it happens for three reasons. There's one primary reason, and the main reason is there's a lack of moisture. Yeah, it really hasn't rained here significantly since June, and that was just one day. You, know, you have to go back uh, you know, to May you know, to find any significant rain. Um, but there's two things that have made it worse as well. One is the heat. July was the hottest July uh, ever in the history of Omaha. You know, any heat moisture that was left over from uh, the recent floods, remember we were talking about floods uh, just recently, 
you know, the, the heat just, it, it just sucked it all up and absorbed it all. You know, and, and the sun would be another factor. There was days when, you know, you could even go out and water your lawn and the sun would just uh, evaporate the water before it would have a chance to hit the ground. Now, just like us in Nebraska are in a, um, a drought, I, I believe that there's some of us that are sitting here right now that would feel like we're in a spiritual drought. Did you hear those words that I used a little bit ago? You know, think about your life. Think about your mind. Think about your soul. Dormant, dying, losing life, lackluster, stressed, strained, unproductive, failing, barren. Are those words that any of us would use to describe ourselves? These are the words of somebody who is in a spiritual drought. Now, I want you to hear this. God has created us for himself. And our hearts will never find rest until we find rest in him. So spiritual drought then is something that affects us in all areas of our life. We are created to live in community with God. And unless we're living in community with God, our hearts will always be restless. We will always be experiencing some sort of spiritual drought in our life. Now, the great sin of humanity is the terrible darkness and drought that comes from living in isolation and loneliness. We are made, we are created to live in a relationship with God, and with other human beings. Now, spiritual drought, just like drought happens for three reasons, spiritual drought will happen for three reasons as well. The first of these reasons is that um, it is, is sometimes our own fault. I really believe that some of us are in a spiritual drought because of choices that we have made or choices we are making. You know, I believe that uh, some of us have... Uh, messed up enough and this uh, stuff that we've done or the stuff that we haven't done, it has had an adverse correlation upon our relationship with God. Now, there's another reason. Part of our spiritual drought may be because of somebody else. You know, maybe somebody else hurt us. Maybe someone else let us down. Maybe we had high hopes for somebody else and it didn't work out quite the way we wanted it to work out. Maybe we have some kind of stress or dysfunction in our essential relationships and we transfer that stress and dysfunction into our relationship with God. You know, sometimes uh, uh, there's, a, there's another reason as well. And sometimes the third reason, in addition to, you know, ourselves and other people, the third reason is some of us are in a spiritual drought because sometimes bad things happen because of uh, natural and unfortunate circumstances. You know, sometimes bad things happen to good people. Sometimes things happen and we don't fully understand out why they happen. But what that does then is it, it stresses our relationship with God. And oftentimes, as a pastor, I'll hear things like, well, why would God uh, put me through this? Or why is God letting this happen to me? And I don't necessarily think that's uh, a right way to think about things. I think sometimes it's things that we have done to ourselves. I think it's times when other people have hurt us. I think it's times when natural but unfortunate things happen to us. And I don't believe that God is the problem. I believe that God is the solution. Now, once uh, we become aware that our main business in life once we become aware that our own uh, purpose in life is to connect and relate to God, what happens next is most problems will take care of themselves. When we can embrace and when we can understand and when we can live out that the main business and the main purpose of life is to live in a relationship with God, then what happens is most problems will take care of themselves. Now, there's something that you need to hear this morning. And, you know, some of us have come and this drought thing is far away from where you're at. You know, it's raining every day in your life and the grass is green and the, the, uh, the trees are growing and the leaves are still on the trees. You know, and I praise God and I'm so thankful that this is where God has you at this season in your life. And I also know that some of us uh, 
this morning are, are hurting people. You know, I know that because uh, you share part of your life with me, and I know that because statistically it would be impossible to be anything other than that. Now, whether the rain is coming down every day or whether the rain hasn't come down for months, there is something that you need to know. And the thing that we all need to know is this, that we are the one who is responsible for our relationship with God. Now, if you're uh, sitting next to your parents, you know, kids, I want you to hear this. Your parents are not uh, responsible for your relationship with God. You are. You know, if you're sitting next to a, a... a, a spouse. I want you to know that your spouse is not responsible for your relationship with God. You are. You know, if uh, uh, there's people in your small group that you relate to, they're not the ones who are responsible for your relationship with God. You are the one who is responsible for your relationship with God. Now, whatever the relationship is, or whatever the relationship isn't, wherever you are in life or wherever you're not, You can grow right now. The drought can end. You can flourish in your relationship with God. For those who are going through an incredibly tough time right now, I want you to know that I have seen people flourish and grow and thrive. And they have emerged as stronger people. They have emerged through this hardship as people who are fully dependent upon the God who has brought them out. You know, for uh, some of you who are blessed right now and things are great, you know, I have seen people grow and flourish with God uh, at this point in their life. You know, they wake up and the first thing they do is they thank God for his provision. The last thing they do is they thank God for his goodness. You know, I think that most of us are probably in between those two points. You know, there's parts of our life that uh, are probably going pretty well, um, but there's parts of our life where we're uh, definitely struggling as well. And you know what? God can take us in those ordinary moments. God can take us in the times of ambivalence. God can take us in the times of busyness and grow us into a closer uh, child of his. You know, there is no place in your life right now that we can't grow in our relationship with God. You are responsible for your relationship with God. Now, here's one of the things I believe. I believe that we are not at peace with other people because we're not at peace with ourself, and I believe that we're not at peace with ourself because we are not at peace with God. Well, the time is right now. Not tomorrow. Not next week when this project is done. Not next month when this is behind you. Not next year when you get a fresh start. The time is now that the spiritual drought can end. The time is today when we can become at peace with God so that we can be at peace with ourselves, so that we can be at peace with the world. Now, uh, there's a couple ways that I want us to think about as we uh, move forward toward ending the spiritual drought that may exist in our life. Now, the first of these two is uh, to simply embrace uh, the people who are most important to God. You know, to embrace the thing that is most people, important to God. And that, that, that is this people. Now, we got this great text this morning from Isaiah chapter 58. Now, in verses 1 through 5, we didn't read that part, but in verses 1 through 5, here's what happened. The people of Israel are seeking to end their spiritual drought. The leaders of uh, the temple are seeking to end their spiritual drought. So you know what they do? They start fasting. And they're thinking, okay, we're not going to eat and we're not going to drink and this is going to impress God and this is going to win his favor. And we're going to do these things and God is going to approve of us because we're giving up this for him. Now, in the meantime, uh, what they're doing is they're uh, not treating their workers very well. They're not being fair. You know, they're uh, being very haphazard in the way that they uh, treat God's children. So... Here's what God says, and we pick it up in verse 6. No, this is God speaking. No, this is not the kind of fasting that I want. You know, I don't care if you guys don't drink or don't eat. All that's going to do is make you hungry and thirsty. This is not what I'm looking for, God says. What I want is for you to free those who are wrongly imprisoned. I want you to lighten the loads of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. Share your food with the hungry and give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them and do not hide from relatives who need your help. Then your salvation will come like dawn and your wounds will heal quickly. 
Now, in that last uh, verse there, in verse 8, uh, in Hebrew, there's actually some wordplay going on. And the word uh, Jeshua, it's where we get our word Jesus, is the same word that's used for salvation and the same word that is used for healing. So what the writer is talking about here is salvation that comes in the world to come, but healing, healing that can happen right here, right now in this world. Now, God is trying to impress upon the people of Israel right here, right now, at this time in the text, that healing and restoration happens in our life when we help God bring healing and restoration to the life of others. God is saying that we cannot completely love God until we love the thing that is most important to God, and that is his people. It kind of goes like this. Yesterday, we handed out uh, 2,000 bottles of uh, cold water at the Miller Days Parade. And I don't know, there's probably 12 to 15 of us that showed up or so, and you can do the math. That's a lot of water per person. And uh, two of those were my uh, two sons, Benjamin and David. Now, once the parade got started, um, getting two kids to hand out water is not an easy sell because everyone's throwing out candy. And we got this great big thing of candy uh, in our house right now. Um, I'd actually take a dolly and move it into the house. It was so heavy. And um, you know, David was so cute. He had one, one of the small shirts, but it's like still comes down to here on him. And every political candidate that's running for any office in Nebraska, he's got that sticker on the shirt. You know, he's a Democrat and Republican. He's part of the Green Party and the Tea Party and the Red Party or whatever parties there are. And he had these necklaces that he was wearing. And someone came and gave him some, some beads to put around his neck. And he had absolutely no interest in going with us once the parade started to hand out the rest of the water. Now, Benjamin thought it would be fun. Um, he thought it'd be fun, and he started with us, and then they threw out some candy, and you know, he'd be picking up the Skittles, putting them in his pockets, and handing out water simultaneously. And you know, Amber and I took uh, six cases of water in a big wagon, and we uh, turned out all the water. But we had to do something before we did that. We had to make sure that someone would watch our uh, five-year-old son. You can't just leave this kid uh, in a parade unattended. Yeah, so we were kind of where all the rest of the people were, and there was three people who were happy to volunteer to watch this kid, you know, because they loved him. And I knew that when we started walking down that crowded street with that wagon, I knew that this kid was in just as good a hands if I was watching him myself because they loved him. Now right there, there's uh, an instant connection between me and those three people that volunteered to watch the kid. Because they love the thing that is most important to me. And when we love the thing that is most important to God, the relationship between us and God will uh, flourish and and it will thrive. Stick with me on this one. This is a longer quote. It's by a Catholic theologian, Henry Nouwen. And here's how we relate to other people. And think about what he's saying here. He's 100% right on the mark. When we honestly ask ourselves which person in our life means the most to us, we often find that it is those who, instead of giving advice, solution, or cures, have chosen, rather, to share our pain and touch our wounds with a warm and tender hand. I'm not sure if the world needs as much caring and advice giving as it needs warm, uh, tender hands who who will indeed touch our wounds. And being that warm and tender hand, what that does is it gives us a deep connection to the one who has created us. I don't believe we can fully embrace another person without somehow embracing God as well. You know, so that's part one. Part two uh, is that we got to end the one-sided relationship. we got to end the one-sided relationship. Has anyone ever been in a one-sided relationship before? Most of us have, and it's no fun. You know, we're the ones that were loving. We're the ones that were patient. We're the ones that uh, uh, gave second chances. We're the ones uh, uh, who just tried and tried and tried to make the thing work. But the other party um, just wasn't as interested as us. Now, you've felt that before, haven't you? Well, welcome to God's world. I really believe that uh, many of us are in a one-sided relationship with God, and we wonder why we have a spiritual drought. You know, um, 
God has to feel like this. God has to feel like sometimes that he's the only one that's communicating. He's the one that's trying to make things right. He's the only one who loves unconditionally. Now, as a human being, if we're in a one-sided relationship for too long, guess what? That relationship is going to end. And even if the two parties are in close proximity with each other, the relationship can still be dead. Now, the good news for God, the good news with our relationship with God, if we have been in a one-sided relationship with God, God is going to keep loving just like the sun is going to keep on shining. God loves us in times of prosperity and joy. God loves us in times of ambivalence. And God loves us and is with us throughout these times of spiritual drought. Now, Isaiah chapter uh, 58, verse 9, the Bible says, When we call on God, he will answer us. When we call on God, what that means is the one side relationship is over. We are calling on the name of the Lord. And there's different ways that we do that. One of the ways that we can call on the name of the Lord is through prayer. Now, what prayer will do in our lives, what prayer will do in our lives, and listen to this, prayer will move us from just knowing about God to knowing God. You know, prayer will end the one side relationship. Now, if this is new to you, if you said, you know, I've tried to pray before, but I, I just haven't been able to be consistent. It's nothing that I've ever succeeded at. Just hear this, uh, hear this little thing. Keep it simple. Keep it real. You know, hide absolutely nothing from God. If there's anger, give that to God. If there's joy, share that with God. If there's thanksgiving, share that with God. If there's pain or frustration, share that with him too. Um, when we pray the way we feel, then the prayer is good. The second thing to do is... Uh, 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 set small goals and achieve those goals and then move on to the next one. The last thing I want anyone to do is leave this place and fail in the area of prayer because you weren't able to pray for two hours a day. Well, there's very few of us that can do that, but most of us can give this a try for five minutes a day and just just see where it goes. You know, the next thing um, that we connect to God, I mean, we call it his name is uh, uh, through reading the Bible. Now, in two weeks, we're going to start this wonderful plan you know, where for 40 days, for six weeks, where we're going to really discover how to um, uh, love the Word and how to learn the Word and how to live out the, world, the Word in our life. Now, what I'm not trying to do from you is take away 15 minutes of your day. What I'm trying to do is allow us to call upon the name of the Lord to end the one-sided, uh, the one-sided relationship where we can speak to God and where God can speak to us. This happens through Bible study and through prayer. Now, the third and fourth ways, I'll just group together in one way. It's you know, worshiping God and being in a small group. And what we're doing here is placing ourselves in an environment where God can speak to us. We're placing ourselves in an environment where the one-sided relationship can end. Now, you know, this, uh, it, it takes work, you know. I got 15 or 20 minutes a day. I'm asking you to, to pray and to read the Bible. And there's an hour on Sunday morning, another hour to 90 minutes uh, during the week. It takes time. It takes effort. But you know what? Anything great in life takes some effort, doesn't it? Yeah, I'm going to tell you a story. And uh, I didn't actually ask this guy's permission. Um, he's actually here as well. His, uh, I'll call him Freddie in a story, although his real name's Jason. And... Uh, <clears throat> I texted Jason and asked him a few questions this morning. I saw that he showed up. And last Saturday and Sunday, Jason did something absolutely incredible. Um, he ran a 100-mile race. Now, not, not a 26-mile race, a 100-mile race. Now, this race started in Leadville, Colorado, um, elevation 10,000 feet. You know, during this race, uh, he climbed like two or 3,000 feet. You know, it took him over a day to do this. Now, this is an incredible athletic accomplishment that someone could run a 100-mile race. Now, I know there's some walking. I know there's some stopping, um, but he finished. You know, and last Sunday, I left church, and I checked my phone, and I was really curious how he did, and I saw that he had finished. And you know what? This was not easy, was it? And I'm not talking about, you know, the time from the start to the finish. I'm talking about the preparation. You know, there had to be mornings. There had to be mornings that it was going to be a whole lot easier to sleep in than it was to get up and run. But he got up and ran. You know, there had to be days when he got home from work and you were here this summer. It had to be 100 degrees some of those days. And instead of going into the air conditioning, he got on his running shoes and he hit the trail. Yeah, I know one day he ran 40 miles. He ran from almost Omaha to Lincoln. You know, there had to be times during that run that he wanted to quit, but he didn't. Now, you guys can do this. And here's why I know that the spiritual drought 
can end in your life because you are successful people. Many of you are successful in your workplaces. Many of you are successful in your schools. I look around and I see many of you who are successful as parents in the same focus, the same determination that allows us to succeed in these areas is the same focus and the same determination that will allow us to end the spiritual drought and thrive in our relationship with God. If we place the detail and the emphasis and the priority on our relationship with God that we place on other things in our life, I guarantee you for all of us, the spiritual drought would end. And when the drought ends, I want you to hear what happens. We'll pick this up in verse uh, 11. The Lord will guide you continually, giving you water when you are dry and restoring your strength. Okay, I'll stop right there for a second. Is there anyone in this room who needs guidance? When the spiritual drought is over, God will give us guidance. Is there anyone in this room that uh, needs our strength restored? Darn right there is. And God will do this for us. You will be like a well-watered garden, like an ever-flowing spring. You know, some of you, verse 12, some of you will rebuild the deserted ruins of your cities. You'll be known as a rebuilder of walls and a restorer of homes. You know, many of us have lives that need to be rebuilt. We have renovations that have to happen. And what we do is we uh, end the spiritual drought by embracing the thing that is most important to God. We end the spiritual drought by uh, putting an emphasis and a priority and a focus on that time with God when we connect with God and totally embrace with Him. Then and only then will our lives start to be repaired. Then and only then will our families start to be restored. And as a church, this is a great opportunity for us Listen to this, some of, you'll be, uh, some of you will rebuild the deserted ruins of your cities and then you'll be known as a, a rebuilder of walls and a restorer of homes. And us as the church, then what we can do is we can share this message on how to end the spiritual drought in the people's lives. And we know that people will get along with each other better and people will get along with themselves better because we are getting along with God better. But it all starts with Him. So what I want us to do now is I want us to uh, close this time right now with a time of prayer. And I know that uh, many of us have come in different places. You know, there's 300 of us here right now. You know, and there's 300 different stories. There's 300 different children of God. You know, but God is going to meet you exactly where you are. God's going to meet you exactly where you are. And, and he wants nothing more than this. If there is a one-sided relationship, he wants that to end, and he wants it to end right now. You know, if, if there's someone that we're uh, not treating the best, he wants us to, to treat that person just like he would, we'd treat him if he was in our presence. So let's go to God. Come to the waters that draw you No end fear the Lord Come and listen Come to the waters that draw you Thursday come.